Okay, and we're a little okay. We're live. Okay, the camera's a little low. I'm gonna, I mean, yeah, for yeah, quacky. yeah, for quacky. You you tell them how great this has been. Uh, oh, scoop back, scoop the thing back, okay. tilt the thing down. I okay. keep the okay. hi, everyone. Hi, we're really it's good at this. Normal. So, oh. hey, there we go. All right, get in here. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Steve Karnacki yeah. costume. Ah, Steve was in this apartment a couple days ago. That was very nice. Are Matt. We, uh, are we on? Are we on? Yeah, we're live. It's, someone someone uh, mentioned someone, something in the hello, chat. Hello, no, look, someone. Uh, oh, hello. Hello, thank you. It's Landry. Guys, I'm sorry we're a few Landry minutes late. Home. It's just, it's not my fault. Matt's fault. Hi, it's Matt's fault. Um, wow, Matt Welch. I mean, we've been in the studio separately a lot. There's been a lot of recording in the studio, in case you don't know that, uh, but not for YouTube so much, more for the Paloma Media channel and for Fifth Column and for some, it's true. something new that I'm starting. We'll talk something. about that oh, for no, a second. We're going to talk about I that know, in a I minute. I want to fix the light a little bit. You want to fix the light a Just little bit? Just keep talking. Keep okay, I'll keep, talk. I'll keep talking. Well, we've had, um, we had a little, um, little get together here on Friday. Yeah, nice and uh, anyway, yeah, we're back here. We're back here because... Um, <laughs> Matt was writing about something. <laughs> I hope we're entertaining because we're not actually telling totally. you anything. Um, totally got this. Matt was writing on um, Friday about one of his, I'm not going to say favorite topics, but something you've written about quite a lot, which is Dean Becquet of the New York Times. You can give a little backstory on that. I'm sure we have before. And then I was writing about it yesterday about um, the regime change uh, at the New York Times and about um, Donald McNeil Jr., which I would say I probably wrote about, besides writing about maybe Portland, more than anything else last year. I think we did five podcasts about the Donald McNeil Jr. Wow. situation. I, it seems like overkill. Maybe four. Yeah. And then um, I, I was in here with Bacha Ungar Sargon of Newsweek. And wrote, we it's it's a big story. And as I wrote yesterday for Paloma Media, there are some things that are sort of internal kerfluffles, as uh, as Camille would say, sort of insider baseball that you know, journalists, yeah, 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 we love to chew on it. But this was something actually much larger than that. This is not something that just journalists should be concerned about. Um, yeah, I mean, if you're looking at the reason why uh, we all love to talk about the New York Times, it's not necessarily because we want to be in there, okay? I was in there that. recently. I think I felt, I think I've only done one, maybe two things. Really? For the Times? Okay. Something about McCain. But, um, Catch up, dude. Uh, no, because it's been for all of our lives the paper that the rest of the journalism industry uh, looks at, not just the paper, but the organization that they judge themselves by. And that probably made the point before, but there's an oddity about that because the papers that pattern themselves after the New York Times tend to be, uh, or especially in the older days, tend to be local monopolies, right? New York Times is in a very competitive newspaper environment. Um, so an environment that still, after you know all the degradations, still has the New York Post, has Daily News, two tabloids, Newsday covers the uh, outer boroughs, yep. um, or at least Long Island. Long Island. Uh, uh, the Wall Street Journal covers business, uh, and there's other uh, types of publications. And so it's a niche publication in a really weird, idiosyncratic, one-of-a-kind town. And so a pretty strange thing for the, the paper in Omaha, Nebraska, to pattern itself around um, or anywhere else. Because what do you, you know? What does the New York Times cover? It covers sort of international news from a pretty kind of elite managerial class perspective, uh, including one of my favorite kind of uh, uh, genres uh, under uh, Dean Becquet's uh, editorship, and probably before and certainly afterwards is <laughs> how to make their own consumers feel guilty about their consumer choices. So the uh, oh, man. the uh, nail yeah. salon story, which yeah. reason uh, uh, reason Jim Epstein just threw uh, up all kinds of uh, holes into by re-reporting it. But basically the idea was that these, you know, the places where you go to get nail salons, they're um, being terrible to immigrants. And so yeah, there, it's basically you know, slaves that are being like held in a room in the back, you know, eating out of the same rice cooker. Which didn't hold up at all. No. Um, and there's another uh, series about Amazon uh, workers, which was a uh, better sourced than all of that, but uh, still was kind of uh, contentious. But anyways, all these papers patted themselves after it. So when the Donald McNeil story which to remind people, he was the pandemic COVID reporter who was bounced out um, two years after already having uh, an incident that happened outside of the newsroom, adjudicated within the newsroom, um, but then it was leaked out to the Daily Beast, which specializes in this type of room. The fire starters, that's what I called those, the, the, the reporters. I was gonna do a piece about it, but I, I never did about those two guys, uh, what the Lachlan somebody and 
somebody, somebody. Yeah, call them. Luffin's the Luffin's okay. Yeah, uh, Maxwell Tammy. Maxwell right. Tammy, that's the one. Yeah, they um, they just did. They were. I, I don't know if they're still doing it. I've actually read some good pieces by them. So, I, but in this particular instance, um, they took basically two-year-old information that was delivered from someone within the paper. I don't know who it was. There were rumors about who it was. I'm sure it was more than one person. So it's basically two-year-old information delivered third hand, something that had already been adjudicated within the paper. And they brought it to the Daily Beast who basically uh, set a fire uh, and accused in the, in the headline, uh, this Donald McNeil Jr. who had, was the star lead COVID reporter had been in the paper for 45, 45 years, years. Of call, they called him a racist. Saying that he used a racist slur. And the reason why this becomes interesting is that he didn't. No, he, he didn't. It was the, the difference between use and mention. And in journalism, we do mentions all the time. That's right. Um, Nancy you... said the word X. Um, yes. And if Nancy's a newsmaker, that is itself uh, of interest, even if the word X is something terrible. It, it's a mean slur about a person. Me reporting that is not itself a slur. And in this case, which wasn't even in the paper, which, by the way, has used that slur in question. And, and you it, used it the other day. Uh, I did. In recent. You're happy I, about that, aren't you? Well, no. Camille's I, happy about I, that. I am, because I, I think that I agree with Camille, and I agree Katie Herzog talked about this once. It's like you you put these words in a bell jar, and you, you make sure that they're gathering, 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 gathering more properties to destroy people. Because even if you think the word, you thought it once 17 years ago. That's it. You're done. People will find a reason to do that. So how do you do that? You you add sunshine to it. First of all, I've never used the word in my life. No interest in using it. But the thing is that you, to, to I hate weaponize. It's terribly overused. But that's exactly what, what has been done. And that is what the Daily Beast did. And they did it from my perspective. And I actually looked into this quite a lot. Um, in order to get Donald McNeil unseated. Now, the Daily Beast reporters could care less, I'm sure, if D Donald McNeil is unseated, but certainly what was called, you know, the 150 or so people within the Times wanted him out. Why? I mean, to me, it's ambition. It's a new way to do things. And um, and they were successful. Maybe, but, maybe he's an old prick. We don't know. But I know. Like... Well, even if he was an old <laughs> prick, then, then call him an old prick. Yeah. You know, and then use what's actually there as opposed to, but but let's talk about, I'm, I'm going to let you so, take over the failings of Mr. Beckay. So, I mean, uh, this happened on his watch. Uh, Dean Beckay, um, uh, it was announced last week that he's uh, taking the mandatory age 65 retirement from the editorship uh, of the New York Interesting, Times. Interesting, right? I didn't know term, that. They have term limits. Yeah. Um, two of the last four didn't quite make it there. They were bounced before. Yeah. Well, um, for reasons. reasons. Of, uh, Hal Raines uh, and Jill Abramson both yeah. didn't quite make the finish line because of the uh, internal controversies. Um, but so uh, Joe Kahn, who's the managing editor, Joseph M F. Kahn, whatever, um, he was groomed by Back A to be his replacement. And I, I think it's fascinating because so he's going to be a continuation in the managerial kind of handoff, but he doesn't have Dean Baquet's political moxie. Uh, Baquet, who I worked with at the LA Times, he was the editor of the paper there. I was on the opinion page, which he didn't oversee. Um, but he has always been, everyone has known him, like even at the LA Times back then, it was, uh, oh, he's gonna be the editor-in-chief of the New York Times someday. Like we knew his trajectory. He comes okay. from the uh, Times-Picayune in uh, New Orleans, very good investigative reporter did great stuff in Chicago huh. as well. I didn't yeah, know that. Um, I didn't just know today, that. as a matter of fact, it was announced what his uh, next act is going to be. It's going to be create to create an investigative journalism fellowship thingy at the New York Times, uh, and that will hopefully um, be used to uh, seed stories at local uh, newspapers and regional newspapers, which sounds great. It sounds like an actual perfect thing for Dean Baquet to do in the context of New York Times. It was very interesting to see how many people, smart um, uh, media reporters like Jack Schaefer at Politico and uh, Sean McCreech, I believe, at the New York Magazine, referred to Baquet just kind of casually as a politician. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I remember you saying that. Which but... is not usually our, our fondest term as journalists. And then but... you said Khan does not have that. He doesn't he have doesn't. that kind of slickness or gloss or whatever. So, so Baquet was just, is always, we live in a moment where there's this, this uh, category of editors, right? I would put, Dean Baquet um, at the New York Times, uh, Marty uh, Barron at the Washington Post, right. who just left uh, yeah. a few months back, Jeffrey uh, 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 Goldberg at the Atlantic, mm -hmm. and I'm leaving, leaving out one other, uh, David Remnick at the New Yorker. Mm -hmm. uh, what have they all experienced? They're all 
roughly around age 60, 65 in that in that era, all of them have had the newsroom revolt. They've all had the all staff on deck meeting to talk about why this uh, idea or publication columnist or person that we were even going to feature at a conference in the case of the New Yorker, they're going right. to interview Steve right. Bannon. Right. Um, and why that was terrible because these people are racist and, and we shouldn't platform them. And all of them to various degrees caved underneath this. And the, and the people who- Marty Barron just dipped. He dipped. <laughs> He's right? just like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I've had enough. No, there's a, uh, it's a fascinating, uh, Barry Weiss, when she left the New York uh, Times opinion page a couple of years ago, she sent a scorched earth memo. I'm going to, I'm going to actually put some uh, show notes in here later. So like piece, pieces Matt have written that I've written and Barry's and, and all that stuff. Anyway, carry um, on. Uh, in which she said that there's a generation gap between younger staffers. In fact, she's part of that generation. Right. She has different, she has old, right. old, 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 old prick ideas. Yeah. Apparently. <laughs> I say that with fondness. Um, but, uh, and the, the younger people uh, are, are more likely to talk about, uh, you know, that they're, they're experiencing injury Mm -hmm. by uh, mm -hmm. words or deeds done um, at the paper and who see journalism as more uh, of an issue where we need to use moral clarity instead of traditional ideas of sort of fairness and and uh, and uh, not objectivity but a, a sense of balance um, and so these younger people who are really heavily on social media and they're heavy on slack internal internally um, have much different ideas than the old dudes like Dean Baquet and and otherwise and when she said this two years ago, what happened? She was roundly denounced in public. This is, a, in fact, she had made this claim before she left. Um, she was roundly denounced in public by her colleagues, like, that's not true. There is no generational divide. And yet what happens when you see all of the reporting about Dean Baquet and the challenges that the new editor is going to uh, face, it's like, within two years, it's like everyone acknowledges that there's a generational divide. Um, and that divide is going to largely dictate what these elite journalistic outposts are going to do, and therefore the journalism that you are all going to consume, what's going to be colored by. Right, so that's why I want to say it's not just a little intern kerfuffle. Yes. And let's just use, for example, the McNeil story, okay? So what, I okay, I know that we're older, part of the older generation, and maybe we're schooled in a different way, but the way I understand journalism to work is you go get the best information you can, you check it, you stitch it together in a way that, you know, tells the story in a way that is going to inform the reader. And then, you know, if you get something wrong, you fix it. And then you keep, you know, writing stories as they go along. Well, when you instead cherry pick information and make sure to make it as inflammatory as possible because you have a mission, that is what happened at the Times. And that is what Dean Baquet caped to. And the, of course, the money line is, uh we do not accept racist language no matter what the context is that what yeah, it was it yeah. was I'm, I'm 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 mashing it up a little but okay so you've now just had someone that says that the, the arguably intent doesn't matter intent doesn't matter the the most successful newspaper in the world has just said intent doesn't matter of language of language okay so what are you fucking doing are you making cream puffs over there or are you working with language Okay, and are you working with language where you're putting sentences together? Well, when you've just decided that intent doesn't matter, then you can just do whatever you want, which is what they did. Well, and and they, in the face of criticism, uh, backtracked from that, and that's part they of did. that was part of Baquet's uh, politicianness. He was always <laughs> trying to um, give these really like slippery rationales for what the time standard uh, is. He did this also uh, constantly whenever it had something to do with uh, Islamic terrorists and, and, re and representations of the Prophet Muhammad, uh, God rest his soul, whatever we're supposed to say, inshallah. Um, uh, like uh, he would say, well, we're against gratuitous insults. That's our standard. Um, and oh, over here, here's a picture of the Pope made out of condoms. Yeah. <laughs> like, uh, yeah. What's it gonna be? Uh, uh, he would always invent a new standard and he did that with the, the intent language. What that the standard actually is, is how much the person in charge is going to be scared of the internal newsroom mob that day. Uh, and that's a weird, scary standard. And Oh, you think? We know uh, uh, quite a few people who work at the Times and, and are conversant with them, even in a parasocial way. And, oh boy, there's a, there's a large number of people who work there who aren't as loud 
as the generation underneath them who are constantly agitating. And that is fascinating. And who is going to win that um, is, is it's up in the air. Um, what I find interesting is that Joe Kahn has a very interesting pedigree, he's rich as Oh, yeah. He comes from the Staples family. Uh, his hands are very soft. Um, nice. I'm he's just like saying, taught he's himself so... Mandarin. He's, uh, oh, no, no, he's very accomplished. He's very, very accomplished, accomplished, but he's, he's definitely from a rarefied kind of world. But he's not a glad hander. He doesn't stride through the newsroom. There's lots of people who work there who've never met him, um, which is they never could say that I did back. Hey, he's like smoking cigars and let you know that he's around. So uh, if you lack that political skill and kind of uh, sense of charisma, as David Lee Roth taught us, um, <laughs> then uh, how are you going to deal with that question? And then how are the outsiders going to try to work you as the rep? We've already started to see that with Nancy's favorite columnist, Na uh, not Nancy, but uh, uh, the Margaret Sullivan. You're the same. My, my favorite columnist, Margaret Sullivan. I so The Washington Post Media Column. All I can say is I, I read her because Matt, because Matt, as much as Matt loves me, he also loves to torture me, which is he sends me Margaret Sullivan's column every time they publish. So yesterday, she, it was a big hosanna for Joe Kahn. Okay, she worked at the paper. She felt she, the, the thing that, that got me was she was like, you know, I went in and I said something to him. And he's like, oh, and I, he put his head in his hands. And it, that, that, that gesture said so much, as opposed to someone who crosses his arms in front of his chest. She literally like, said that. She, she said that. I'm so, and, but so, so Margaret Sullivan is a, is a, is a backer of Joe Kahn. Fine. Okay. And then she went on to, you know, whatever, applaud her old job which no longer exists as a the public editor the public editor and saying that that's you know one of the things that he can do to show that he's good is that let's reinstate the public editor or the ombudsman um the newspaper. but but margaret sullivan as long as well as a whole bunch of other people have a true north now like it doesn't matter what it is it's like do we want you know french toast for breakfast or pancakes it, you can be guaranteed by paragraph seven it's going to be our future is on the line democracy is on the line and if if Joe Kahn or whoever it is at the head of the paper does not go in and start writing the stories that are going to, you know, uh, overthrow these kinds of people who committed, you know, January 6th or or Trumpism, you you can't you can't you've got to have an aim in mind. She wants she wants an editor to sort of forthrightly in a news organization to forthrightly identify Republicans as the chief threat to democracy in America. Now it is possible for the sake of argument that she's right, that Republicans are the chief uh, the threat to democracy in America. Let's entertain that as a possibility. Um, as a news organization, as a journalist, what's the best way to combat that? And you can see, you can tell by the people who are already working the refs, including Margaret Sullivan, on Joe Kahn, what do they get to exercise on a daily basis? It's usually adjectives. They want to adjective their way out of this or to not platform. There was a, a piece the other day uh, in the New York Times, it's a pretty good piece about Chris Rufo, Christopher Rufo, who is a education activist. He was right next to uh, Governor DeSantis in Florida the other day with the anti-CRT, anti-Disney bill. Um, he's a total opportunist. He's a political hack. He's very entrepreneurial. He's very consequential in America right now. It's a good idea if you are a journalistic outlet to do a profile trying to understand who and what is driving Christopher Rufo. The Times did that. And a whole bunch of people who are on the democracy is dying in the, in the next breath. In darkness. Uh, uh, beat uh, were completely outraged by what they had a nice photograph of him, and they're like, "You glamorized white supremacy. What the fuck is wrong with you?" Yeah, because you sh what you should do is definitely do a leading photograph. Like you should lead people, like sub rosa, make it dark. You know, maybe maybe a little like insinuation that there's blood dripping from here. Well, it's the same thing. It's not like everybody that I've spoken to in terms of the Steve Bannon, David Remnick thing. It's like, no, obviously you should have had, let David Remnick uh, interview Steve Bannon because he was a force. This was what in 2019, Two something years, like that, yeah. 2018. I mean, he was a gigantic force in the country. We should want to hear from him, especially maybe if you don't like him or don't agree with him. So you can have like more information as opposed to saying that, no, we can't do that because then you're here. Like, why are you scared of information? Uh, we have a, a a bunch of questions. Please, because I can't read them. Can't read them. No. John Carney, I just hope that you're one of the Carneys. He, of course he's one of the Carneys. <laughs> um, says, why do you think the Times has been more vulnerable to the newsroom mob than say the Wall Street Journal or other news organizations? Or do we just know more about the New York Times vulnerability? I mean, there was a there was a Wall Street Journal uh, news side 
revolt that happened that was in similar ways in a, like 18 months ago, but it was, I forget the exact, uh, like the trigger point of it or the denouement of it, but they were like, right, they were going right up to the edge of the all staff meeting, um, you know, rending garments a bit, but they didn't quite get there. I mean, New York Times, who's going to, who's going to be attracted to the New York Times, uh, who is under the age of me? Um, it's going to be, uh, tends to be people who see it in idealistic terms of like being a guarantor of democracy and, and a bastion. I mean, the reason why you have a sense of platforming is that it's, this is a sacred space for kind of, um, our ideas, our ideas, our team. That's right. Um, and, uh, so, uh, I, I think it's more like that than wall street journal, which famously has an editorial page is quite different than the newsroom side. But I think basically every uh, large media organization uh, either has faced this or is going to. I'm very lucky that I work for Reason, which is never going to have this happen. Mm -hmm. not, not even the knock on wood. It's just like structurally impossible to imagine it. But um, uh, how to deal with this inevitable thing is something that I, I guarantee you, every single editor out there um, at a, a semi-prestigious uh, news organization has thought about this, has strategized about it. Um, has has had night sweats about this. Oh my God, uh, that's that's just where the what we live in. Particularly after the May and June of 2020 kind of media nervous breakdown uh, in the wake of the George Floyd uh, uh, events and uh, and uh, and the, uh, just editors and and like leaders of museums right and left being just kind of defenestrated and people doing the uh, great kind of uh, reckoning of past sins. Um, since that moment, like people are just like looking around, freaked out at these institutions. It's a, uh, it's a uh, bizarre. I think also why at the times because if they see that the idea that you know you have an objective in your journalism, if they see that it's working over there, then it's like wow, I want to be part of that team. And in a sense, I mean, if I were like a young twenty-two-year-old idealistic person coming out of Vassar, and I was like, wow, look at, I really want to be a journalist, and I really, I really have these like feelings of like. I think the country should be better. And I think the way to do it is the way the Times is doing it. And they, they seem to be successful at it, like getting rid of that racist Donald McNeil Jr. That's where I want to go work. Well, I think, you know, our obligation as people, and we got a, I had a little something on Paloma Media yesterday. I got, we got like a fan letter saying like, thank you for writing about this. I think I really was looking for stuff about Donald McNeil Jr. And so we should know, and I'll put a link into it. He wrote a big piece um, on his Medium um, page about uh, Joe Kahn coming in and what he thought was possibly going to be the result of that. He actually had some pretty nice things to say about FK, which I thought was pretty generous. He's, saying, he's like, you know, I, I, you know, he's a good guy. We've known each other for a very long time. They're probably around the same age. And he's like, I didn't like the way things turned out, but, but here's, but what he did say about Khan was like, if Khan doesn't think that there are actually Maoist struggle sessions going in, he's got to open his eyes. Yeah. And I think it is up to us as people who are like, you know, can see that this is pretty clearly happening, though I want to add something to add to that, which is kind of sounds like I'm being uh, conceited, but I don't mean it to be. Um, you know, if we keep shining a light and saying, well, wait a second, check it, check it, don't be, you know, don't be a fire starter, but actually look at things calmly and report, for instance, on the McNeil thing. But I will say something, uh, when the, uh, uh, the Kenosha verdict came out last uh, November, um, I was contacted by an editor at the opinion pages to write a piece about it because I wrote about Portland a lot. I was actually kind of surprised because I've been pretty critical of the Times opinion pages uh, of, for the past year or two years. And especially they, they were definitely not writing about Portland the way I was, but they contacted me and ran it. And I thought, well, that shows you that actually they, they are going to be willing to, you know, have other voices in the room about extremely hot issues. So I give them some credit, like maybe, maybe there's more room for that too. McNeil's point about the struggle sessions, um, Maoist struggle sessions, um, because there's a quote in the New York magazine uh, profile of Joe Kahn where you can see he's trying to respond to sensitive criticisms and he hasn't quite found the perfect language to, to straddle in the way that Dean Becquet famously did. Um, but he's like, ah, I don't think there's, we have, you know, struggle sessions. Well, what the Times has done uh, with Donald McNeil uh, Jr., with Andy Mills, their podcaster, yeah. who they kicked out of the door. At the same time, it's kind yep. of part of the yep. same thing. Um, what do they spend so much of that time in that process doing? Haggling over the apology letter. Oh, What yeah. is that if not a struggle session? It is a, and what one of the things that the 150 times staffers demanded 
was an apology and it had to be a certain type of apologies, which is crazy. Um, let's go to uh, another Please. other question. Adam Coslin, it's charming that you guys still think that the point of the news business is to be the impartial purveyors of truthful information. I don't think I said that's the point of the news business. Um, uh, it's the news business is the news business. It has lots of different points, um, serves different audiences and whatnot. Um, and it'll change and evolve. And also we're not cynical. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not. It's, it's like, uh, not, it's not even, the, it's not even impartial purveyors. No. I, I'm totally partial about a lot of different things. Yeah. Um, but I have an expectation that I am going to be truthful um, and that I'm going to be as diligent as possible about not saying something that isn't true, not misrepresenting somebody uh, and that kind of thing. Regardless, I mean, there's Michael Kinsley, who predated me at the LA Times, has, and you can find deep in the bowels of, of the interwebs somewhere, he wrote a series of really fantastic memos about opinion journalism. Um, and he talked about how actually opinion journalism, you should have in some ways even a higher, more exacting standard about finding your uh, ideological opponent's best argument and treating with that, because that's how you get to a point of persuasion and you also challenge yourself. Um, Isn't that what steel manning is? I it, it is, yeah. uh, basically, yeah. Um, yeah. but without the tech bro yeah. kind of. I, I, I didn't understand <laughs> what the, the first seven times you guys used it. I'm like, what is that? Anyway. Uh, let's see, Steven Vonietz. Hey, Steven. Bah. How you doing? Uh, many editors fear for their jobs. In Remnick's case, SI Newhouse always let him totally loose as long as New Yorker made money, but Newhouse passed in 2017. Could that have marked a change? Certainly, right? Like, um, and it's and I, I want to give credit to Dean Beck. Um, and this I mentioned in my piece too. He inherited a newsroom that was firing people. Remember when Carlos Slim, the Mexican billionaire, yeah. had to like bail out the paper? Yeah. Um, and people were like, okay, what you gonna cover about Mexico now? Um, that was in 2014, and he leaves the paper when it's just, you know, digital subscriptions have absolutely boomed. Um, he might have and probably did benefit from a kind of a Trump boomerang effect. Trump and both the New York Times and the Washington Post were kind of the recipients more than any other uh, news outlets, maybe MSNBC, um, uh, with uh, with getting that. So maybe he's walking out at, at a perfect time. You're squinting here. Somebody's saying, hey, Nancy, I saw you with my friend Wes in Austin at the bar. Yes, you did. Hey, how you doing? That was a very cool bar, and Wes is a very cool bartender. And I, I hope to see, see both of you guys again soon. Yeah. Okay. Um, but uh, anyways, what was that? Your my questions. Something. Yeah. Question. That, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Else, question was a heart. So that's very good. <laughs> uh, Eric, yeah, I'm glad I finally made one of these while well, still in progress. Yes, we do a lot of good warning in advance. Uh, we're going to be doing more of these. Yes, we are. Uh, going forward. Yes, um, we are. And maybe we'll, maybe even once a week. Could, could yeah. just do it. Should we just do it uh, Tuesday? Tuesdays. Tuesday, Tuesday form, lunch. The 40 minute bitch on Tuesday. That's right. The 40 minute bitch. That's. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> Send swag. Uh, cool. Yeah, that works. Um, speaking of 40 minute bitches, uh, Nancy. <laughs> what? I know what you're going to say. Do you want to tell the kids about your new thing? Yeah. So what, part of what we're, we're doing this, we're doing this in the studio, which uh, we yep. christened Paloma when we built it out a year and change ago. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. Actually, I think we didn't actually do the first one until about a year ago uh, last month because we like I was putting stuff up with my nightgown and buying equipment. But yeah, it's about a year old. We're about a year old. This uh, little studio. And we started a website um, that you all should go to for Yep. Um, last November. And a uh, part of the idea was like, let's just sort of let's use this space and work and do things and find stuff. Uh, incubate things and whatnot. Uh, one of the great ones, Yael, in the, in the comments, the Ask a Jew with Yael and uh, Hialeah, whose name I'll always butcher. Hialeah is super. And so it's Ask a Jew uh, podcast. You can find it wherever you get your, your podcasts. And uh, they actually might start a little like a Substack addendum so that they could like. I think they should go straight to OnlyFans. Yeah, like well, yeah, man. yeah, yeah. With the, well, with the dick shaped hollows, because that's, <laughs> that's true. That's, that's, that's one of their specialty. Hialeah is. Specialties is baking the dick shaped hollows. But uh, <laughs> hi, guys, girls got to make money, right? Okay. Yeah, a, so, um, but yeah, Ask a Jew. Yeah, that's right. Got, um, Ask a Jew got like, got named best Jewish podcast of 2022. So, that's yeah, but actually, it's kind of our like breakout podcast. We're just riding in your wake, Gail. But now. Now, well. Uh, yeah, so there is a, uh, it's kind of a cute story, actually. There's, um, there's a journalist named Sarah Heppel. She's in Dallas. And about back in February, she had a pretty cool essay called um, um, Things I'm Afraid to Write About. Matt sent it to me. I loved it. it. turned out like the same day she wrote 
an, an, an email or a letter to the fifth column. It was a mash note. A mash note, basically, were there pictures for Seven. Michael? Seven. Um, uh, and saying, oh, this, 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 you know, whatever most, I don't know, forward thing anybody ever did to get on your podcast because she just wanted to meet the guys because they helped her through, as the fifth column guys have helped a lot of people through the pandemic, making them feel less crazy and like you feel like, feel like you know them anyway. I wrote to her, we start talking and we started podcasting. And we were just doing it for the Paloma Media channel. And um, they're people like them. They're kind of fun. They're so great. so we decided to make it official. And uh, we named it. It's called Smoke Em If You Got Em. And we uh, were over at Paloma, but we um, launched a little sub stack. And basically, the first official Smoke Em If You Got Em podcast, I mean, all the other episodes are up there already, uh, will drop tomorrow morning. So go over there and um, sign up. I mean, you can pay for it, which would be awesome. You know how Substack works, so you can get it for free. We'll have some free episodes and some uh, paywall stuff in. OnlyFans. Or, OnlyFans, yeah. So we've got a couple of OnlyFans ideas. Um, oh no. But I'm not gonna. I'll just uh, just keep those under wraps for now. But um, we're talking about we're talking about media. We're talking about girl stuff, boy stuff, sex, drinking, uh, me too. Um, and you know whatever's hot in the culture right now. So go check it out. The uh, the first episode, which is the only one I listened to, because I have almost never listened to podcasts. I, I was very surprised that you did. You never listened to podcasts. I wanted to listen to this one. All right. And it was so good. It was just so good. Like two smart dames slinging bullshit. Grown ass chicks. I think that's what she chicks. called us. Two gro- she didn't like grown ass chicks. Right now it's just uh, journal babes. Over on, yeah, she didn't want she didn't she wanted me to use women in the title and I I, I couldn't do it. Only See? If you, only if you do with the Y. What? Anyway, so anyway, so that's yeah, that's uh that's round. I would love to have you there. Please subscribe. It's fun to watch people subscribe. Look what Eric says. He says what it's he really it's re- I've really been enjoying your podcast with Sarah, so I'm glad it's becoming more permanent. Exactly. It is. Yeah, we decided what? to do it and the Substack guys who we've met are so nice and so lovely, Hamish and Chris and they're like, you should do it over on Substack. I'm like, I think I will. So that's where we are. That's where we are. That's yeah. what we do. Okay. Um, uh, other questions, uh, comments, concerns, New York Times. So here's here's what I want you to, to watch for in the near future. One of the things that Dean Beckett did as he was leaving um, is he sort of gifted um, uh, as a parting gift um, a new social media policy because he has always claimed, and I believe that his belief system is here, that it's embarrassing to watch people in the newsroom slag one another on Slack, which they or not even Slack on, on Twitter, on Twitter, on Twitter. Um, which they have. Uh, Nicole Hanna Jones oh, in particular has the 1619 uh, Project uh, purveyor has uh, slagged. I mean, she slagged that. Michael people. Powell, man. How uh, many times has she gone after Powell? More Michael than once. Michael Powell was a very, very conscientious, great reporter. Who, an incredible journalist. I, I He is really I one of my not, favorite journalists. We're not right? dooming him by saying that he's good. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> uh, no, he's like an old ACLU yeah. lefty guy um, yeah, he's who great. writes. Uh, great. He like works through complicated like campus stories, uh, you know, stories under the rubric of cancel culture, and kind of works through them and figures out what actually happened in the controversy. Yep. Yep. Who knew? Like actually figure out stuff that yep. happened in the controversy. But she slagged him. So anyways, Dean McKay on, on his way out the door said, "We're going to have a new policy where we're just going to pair that back. We are going to encourage people to maybe not have." A Twitter account think twice about airing their uh, dirty laundry and all this. Uh, that has been a method for the younger generation to um, put pressure, uh, external pressure, on the internal newsroom machinations. Um, and I'm uh, confident that it led directly to Donald McNeil getting bounced 100%. and Andy Mills getting bounced, 100%. Uh, among others. Um, and so this is the policy left in place. So what happens? It's going to be tested. Watch oh. certain people's uh, Twitter accounts over the next month or two, and also watch everybody trying to work the refs in the Margaret Sullivan. Plus, way. something else happened with Twitter uh, yesterday, the day before, whenever it was. It's That's true. right. So we're, I don't think we're going to talk about that mm-hmm. today. I have actually had a little bit of an interesting conversation with Yael here about. Thank you, bullshit. Oh, thank you. Pimping. Thank you. Um, about that policy. So look, you have certain arrows. In your quiver, I never know if it's quivers in your arrows, arrows in your quiver. You have arrows in your quiver, and and one of the things that um, has worked is, for instance, the 150 activist reporters at the Times feeding information to the Daily Beast, or if that happened, and whatever, and then seeing their campaign mount and seeing them knock people down, like, oh wow, it works, dude, my arrow is flies so straight and true. Okay, great. Well, if if that arrow stops 
that's flying straight and true, which I think it, it, I hope it will. It's like, damn it, you took away my best arrow. Well, Twitter is one of their best arrows. I mean, I don't use it to bring people down. I use it to comment, certainly. But um, so I talked to Yale about this and she's like, you cannot, you cannot, it is how people under a certain age use social media, whether it's TikTok or Twitter or OnlyFans. <laughs> Um, so, I mean, I, I think people should just not use it to bring people down, but obviously that's never going to happen. So it will be interesting to see how, how people get around this edict at the times. And also people are like, they don't have, the paper does not have the right to tell its employees that they can't do that. What do you, what do you think about that? I mean, uh, I'm a, I'm old prick. Uh, so like uh, so many old pricks around here. Well, I mean it's a, it, I mean it's something that, that comes up. Uh, I mean the, the the gradations of Twitter usage on even at a place like the Reason, um, it, there's an age skew to it, the way that it's used um, to the kind of uh, pr promiscuity of it, uh, the purposes of it. Uh, it's uh, it's fascinating to watch. So. Uh, where I, I'm glad that I did the Dean, dean Back with Catherine Mangu Ward back in 2016. I didn't leave any like policy out the door, but I was leaving just as that type of usage is, is, is going. So it wasn't a big problem for me, what my damn colleagues were tweeting about. Um, uh, and so I'd never had to really face it, uh, but, uh, but it's, an, it's an issue of, of any editor in any place. And uh, if you're gonna restrict, it's gonna be hard. It's like tr trying to take a cell phone away from a kid. Um, which I'm, or a teenager, which I'm. You would, you, you wouldn't know anything about that. Love um, to be able to do. Um, okay, well. One other point about this. What? Yes, which is that. So um, you can already see in the discussion of uh, of Joe Kahn and uh, and such like, and you can see this too uh, around the uh, the New Year. For some reason, this was the the anniversary of the January sixth uh, riot in Capitol Hill. Was bringing similar uh, commentary within the kind of journalism navel gazing uh, sphere, which normally you're safe to ignore. But the ideas that are that are kind of uh, percolating in those places oftentimes get translated into the media that you're going to consume with the journalism sure. product. So it's it's interesting to keep track of something I've paid attention to for 25 years and written a lot about. And so one of the big themes of that is that. This election, in particular, in November, which is going to be a bloodbath for Democrats, it just yeah. there's almost no way that it's not going to be. Um, which is normal. I mean, it's cyclical. This stuff happens, right? Uh, yeah. The only time it hasn't happened in the last, as you know, forty years was after 9/11, the 2002 yeah. Yeah. George W. Bush. Oh, and we so kind of understand sense. that. Yeah. Um, so uh, that is being portrayed as a referendum on democracy itself, and there's a pressure on journalists by the journalism navel gazer industry to identify it as such. So they are going to be trying to police every adjective and every headline and every tweet. Um, and that if you don't, you know, if you don't front load that this Republican dog catcher winning over here is a direct threat on democracy, then you are doing the bad journalism. Again, I say this as someone who's totally alarmed by, for instance, the Pennsylvania gubernatorial debate, was it gubernatorial or Senate, whatever, uh, that happened, I believe yesterday. Um, there are people, uh, uh, and in Georgia as well, like their opening statement is like, well, the 2020 election was absolutely rigged and Trump should have won. Um, yeah. And to the extent that this is a thing and that secretaries of state in places like Michigan are uh, are fabulists when it comes to this conspiracy theorist, that's horrifying and should be covered. Um, and I think robustly, I don't think that uh, it is going to be a shortcut to accuracy to say that anyone voting for a Republican or the Republican themselves um, is uh, by default a reactionary white supremacist and is going to overturn democracy. I don't think that's going to make journalism better or more truthful, and it's certainly not going to get you a bigger audience, is my prediction. But watch that happen over the next six months. It's going to be fascinating. Uh, quickly, can you read any questions we need to read? Sure. Uh, Polish Pimping says, meanwhile, FBI can entrap people for political press. No one cares. Uh, uh, don't know if that happened for political. There's a reference to the Michigan govern, governor uh, being, uh, you know, allegedly kidnapped. Yeah. It's all like FBI yeah. informants all the way down, yeah. which was kind of clear at the beginning, where it was like it was a good guess at the beginning. I don't know. I haven't seen reporting and, yeah. and share and it. share with me. I mean, I read Jacob Solomon Reason writing about this 
Um, please share anything that, that suggests that there was a political motivation behind it. Don't rule it out. FBI is not exactly the nest, yeah. nest of, of non-political motivations. Um, and uh, and I'm, I'm sure there's chicanery afoot, but uh, also I haven't seen that uh, uh, proved or, or suggested with any kind of seriousness. Okay, we're bumping up on 40 minutes. It's the 40 minute bitch 40 hour. Minute bitch. So anything else there? <laughs> By the way, Matt is reading this, not because I can't read, because I can read, but I, I can't see that far. She, so. She's too vain to wear glasses. Uh, yeah, ha, ha. We know this. Oh, it's it's past 40 minutes. Okay. okay. Bye, guys. We'll see you here next Tuesday. Hopefully see you here next Tuesday. Okay. Okay, thanks. Bye. Bye. Hope to see you next Tuesday. See you next Tuesday. Uh, <laughs> bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye.